This film begins in an alternate universe. Mark Grayson, aka The Invincible, has sided with his father, Nolan, aka The Omni-Man, as they conquer Earth in preparation for the super-powered alien race, Viltrum. As the last hero standing, the immortal fends off Mark by himself. He grabs Mark by the throat when Omni-Man arrives and cuts off his arm. He struggles to fight them both with one arm, so Omni-Man breaks his other arm and quickly decapitates him. Mark catches the decapitated head in mid-air and crushes it. Nolan comments on how the immortal lived for thousands of years trying to make this planet better for its people, and that he hoped he could have seen the truth and sided with him as Mark did. In a devastated city, Mark goes on air urging everyone to stop rebelling against the Viltrumite Empire. He promises them food, shelter, health, and security, but warns them that the more they resist, the worse it gets. A hooded man walks across the city unnoticed and into an underground base. He reports back to Robot and Adam Eve, having secured the null energy where the immortal had to sacrifice his life for it. Suddenly, the ground shook, and both Invincible and Omni-Man showed up. Eve confronts Invincible while Robot takes out Omni-Man with their weapon, which proves to be ineffective against him. Omni-Man murders some of the Resistance members, while Invincible is forced to paralyze Eve when she refuses to surrender. Mark and Nolan calmly tell the rest that they are to be executed, having chosen to become part of the Resistance. Angstrom Levy speaks up and claims that justice will come for them for their senseless brutality. Nolan interrupts and is about to execute him when a portal shows up below him, and he escapes the massacre. The scene returns to the central universe, where Mark fights off his father and saves Earth. One month after Nolan's departure, Mark still struggles with his father's betrayal. He aimlessly flies around the city, helping people where he is needed. He and his mother decide to move on with their lives, with Mark returning to school while his mother returns to work. Mark is still unable to forgive himself for what happened in Chicago, and blames himself for all the people who have died. He later meets with Cecil and begs him to put him back on missions again, claiming that he is ready. Cecil disagrees with him and advises him to focus on his family and studies. He believes that Mark is still suffering from trauma over what happened in Chicago. Meanwhile, the Mahler twins escape prison when a portal opens in their cell. They emerge in a wreckage in an alternate dimension where scientist Angstrom Levy meets them. They speculate that he cannot open a portal within the same dimension as Angstrom had to use a crater deep enough to reach them in the GDA's prison from where they were. Although initially reluctant to work with the Mahler twins, Angstrom is forced to do so as they are the only ones with their scientific expertise. Angstrom takes them to a warehouse by the docks, showing them a giant machine that the Mahler twins recognize as somatic encoders. He explains how he based them on the twins' design that can read, copy, and even write human minds. The only problem is he can't get it to work, to which the twins explain he needs more processing units to activate it. Before the twins agree to help him, they ask Angstrom what the machine is for and what's in it for them. Angstrom reveals that he has the power to access all alternate dimensions. He claims that some dimensions differ from theirs in the smallest ways while others couldn't be more different. He explains that each dimension has something unique and valuable, and with this machine they can share knowledge between dimensions to solve problems they would typically fail. He believes that by doing so, they could save billions of lives, but to do so, he would need help. Angstrom has collected various alternate versions of himself, which would help provide intimate local knowledge of their home dimensions to determine what they do best and how to get it here. Using the device, he intends to copy their knowledge into his brain. One of the twins asks, why not just ask them questions? To which Angstrom responds that only someone who can see the whole puzzle can put it together. He asks for the twins' help, and in exchange, he promises them any single dimension they want. Somewhere in the city, the Guardians struggle to take down a giant creature on a rampage. Rexplode keeps it distracted while the others evacuate the citizens. 
Monster Girl knocks the giant on one leg, while Black Samson and Shrinking Ray use their powers to take it down. Robot suggests dropping the giant into a multi-level parking garage below it. He laid out the bomb charges, but the giant knocked him down before he could blow it up. Rex blows it up, and the fight continues underground. Monster Girl saves Robot when the giant tries to crush him. When she asks what happened, Rudy, aka Robot, explains how he couldn't move, his heart was racing, and he was all sweaty. Amanda, aka Monster Girl, claims that what he is feeling is fear, which she understands is a new feeling to him, given how, before all this, it was just a video game for him. Back at headquarters, Cecil is disappointed with the team's lack of teamwork. He describes the current Guardians to be slow, unprepared, and undisciplined. Their takedowns take too long, and the public pays the price. He explains how they have analyzed their last 15 engagements and narrowed down the problem to a failure of leadership. Ruddy explains how he is still adjusting to his new body. Cecil proposes a change in leadership and appoints the recently revived Immortal as their leader. He hopes his thousand years of experience will help improve things and work on their coordination. In addition, Cecil explains that the team also needs more muscle, so he is adding Bulletproof to the team. The Immortal quickly jumps into his new role and informs everyone of their new training schedules. Having demoted Rudy, Cecil claims he still wants him to be part of the team. Rudy explained how this was different from the outcome he wanted, but he understood and would follow orders. Amanda tries to comfort Rudy, but he claims that Cecil is correct and that he needs to get it fixed. Back at the Graysons, Debbie is surprised when Olga, Red Rush's widow, shows up unannounced. She has just returned from her trip to Moscow. Debbie explains how, when she first saw Olga with a knife, she thought she was out for revenge on Omni-Man murdering Red Rush. Olga claims poison would have been easier. Debbie breaks down, both sad and angry, at the same time. She is furious at Nolan for murdering so many people and even almost murdered Mark, his own son. What got to her was when Nolan claimed she didn't matter and that he only thought of her as somewhat of a pet. She apologizes to her for how she's acting and explains how she doesn't have anyone to talk to. She keeps it all inside and describes it as like acid that's eating her away until she's hollow. Olga worries she won't be there to help her through this, so she gives her a card from a therapist she knows who helped her when she was grieving Red Rush's death. At school, Amber, Mark's girlfriend, helps him get his mind off things and explains that everything that happened in Chicago was not his fault. He later confided in Eve, telling her that he had always wanted to be like his father growing up. After everything that has happened, he worries that it might actually happen and that he'll become him without him knowing. She reassures him that he is not his father and that the world knows that. Following their escape from prison, Cecil and the GDA finally track the Mauler twins down at a warehouse near the harbor. Although they are still determining what the twins are building, they confirm it is big and dangerous. When Cecil is about to call in the Immortal, Mark shows up and begs him to let him work for him again. He promises to follow orders and let him make the calls. Given the urgency, Cecil suddenly agrees to bring Mark in when they suddenly receive reports of massive energy spikes. The Mauler twins hook up the other angstroms to the machine while demanding the main one to open the portals so they can hook their device to the ones in the different dimensions. They intend to use the Machini to gather the collective knowledge of the alternate angstroms to advance Earth's technology and save others. The twins warn Angstrom that once they start, it will be impossible to stop and that Severy brained Midge would be the least of his problems if he does. While transferring thousands of memories into Angstrom, Invincible shows up determined to stop them. He tried to get them to surrender, but the Mauler twins refused. Angstrom tries to reason with Invincible and explains that they are doing this for the greater good. When Invincible refuses to stand down, Angstrom uses his powers to summon alternate versions of the Mauler twins across dimensions. 
Although physically strong, Invincible is outnumbered and eventually overwhelmed by their numbers. They brutally beat up a weakened Invincible and nearly murdered him, which was against Angstrom's wishes. Seeing Invincible covered in blood, Angstrom claims he won't build his utopia with blood and prematurely stops the transfer as he forcibly tries to remove the device on his head. The machine explodes violently and destroys the entire warehouse. The explosion takes out most of Angstrom's alternate selves and many of the present maulers. The Immortal and the Guardians arrive on the scene, finding a beaten up Invincible unscathed from the explosion. Rex explains how this was not Mark's fault and that he did an excellent job stopping the Maulers from whatever they were planning. Even Cecil was forced to agree with Rex. Mark explains how other people were involved and that even the Maulers didn't deserve this. Cecil convinces Mark to go home while the others check for survivors and determine their plans. Mark comes home with his mom asleep on the table with wine spilling everywhere. Debbie was shocked to see her son bruised, to which he explained that he was working with Cecil again. He claims he fought with the Mauler twins and the warehouse exploded. He offers to make her dinner, to which Debbie appreciates the effort. She handed him the mail from one of the colleges he had applied for. Mark later meets up with Amber to open their application letters together. He finds out they have both been accepted at Upstate University and is thrilled with the idea of still seeing each other at school. On his way home from Amber's, Mark is suddenly confronted by the Immortal. He claims Cecil may believe he is on their side, but the Immortal thinks otherwise. He leaves, but not before telling him he will watch his every move. Amidst the wreckage from the earlier explosion, one of the original Mauler twins survives, albeit disfigured. He is furious at Angstrom for prematurely removing the helmet despite his warning. When he hears some noise, Mauler digs it up, assuming it is his brother, only to find a horrifically mutated Angstrom. Angstrom blames Invincible for interfering with his plan and what happened to him. His mind cannot distinguish between his and the other's memories and he starts remembering the deaths that the alternate Invincibles caused. He escapes into a portal, but not before swearing vengeance on Invincible and his alternate versions. Mauler gets left behind at the wrecked warehouse and vows never to work for anyone again. The End Thank you for watching. Please make sure to subscribe and tap the notification bell to be notified about our next videos. Till next time, have an amazing rest of your day.